Okay, so today is part five in our series of messages titled, The Bible is the Only Accurate Prophecy and History Book. The only accurate prophecy and history book. God will say something in advance of it happening, and he's going to make sure it happens. So everything that he has said that he planned to make come to pass, it's already happened. Now that's history. The stuff that's still in the future, just like everything he said in the past that was supposed to happen, happened. In the future, everything he says is supposed to happen is going to happen. So the Bible is the only accurate prophecy and history book. And a part of the reason why I'm going through this series of programs is to emphasize some of the history so that you can see that you can rely on the Bible 100% for every aspect of your life, okay? Because every word of God is true. So you remember we were looking at people's ages and when somebody was born, and that's how we could keep track of the chronology. Well, from this point forward, we will concentrate on event dates because God stops giving exact genealogical dates for most of Jacob's descendants. So in 1802 BC, Joseph was born, 130. Yeah, 130, sorry. So Joseph was born in 1802. He was 40 years old when his father, Jacob, came to Egypt at age 130. So Jacob was 130 when he came to Egypt, and we know that Joseph was 40. Now you might be saying, well, how can you prove that? Well, thank you for asking. I will show you shortly. <laughs> Therefore, Jacob was 90 when Joseph was born. 90 plus 40 is 130. Since Jacob was born in 1892 BC, we subtract 90 years, and that brings us to 1802 BC when Joseph was born. So just by going through the scriptures, we can see that. Now, in 1785, which is 17 years after he was born, Joseph was 17 years old, and that's when he was sold into slavery. And so we're not going to turn there, but everybody, I think, knows that Joseph was sold into slavery. So the songs that were picked, show me your face, show me your ways, um, is, and be still and know that I am God, is because here are people that had things happen to them that they would have never expected would happen. I'm a good person. God doesn't do bad things to good people. And <laughs> that's a wrong philosophy. Some of us get sick with cancer. Some of us have heart attacks. Some of us are in accidents and get hurt, disabled. Um, and over in Haiti, for instance, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, you just have people who could literally be killed, who are in the church simply because there's gangs that are running rampant in Haiti right now. So it just depends on where you live and time and chance happens to us all. So Joseph was sold into slavery, but he needed to have absolute confidence that every word of God is true. Now, what word of God did Joseph receive that helped him during his time in prison? What word had he received? Exactly. He was going to rule over his brothers and even his parents. So he knew that that was a promise from God. He heard that word before he went into slavery. In fact, that's the reason why his brothers put him into slavery, sold him into slavery, because they were envious of him. They hated him because he was the next to the youngest. Benjamin was the youngest. And it's like, how dare you say that you are going to rule over us and you're going to rule over mom and dad? And so they were envious of him and they sent him uh, they sold him into slavery. But he had this in mind, the word of God. He had it in mind to help guide him through his most difficult times. And that's what we need, the word of God always to guide us through our most difficult times. So when he speaks to us, we better listen and really uh, take hold of it. And at 29, he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Now I'm going to ask you, what were Pharaoh's dreams? Does anybody remember what his dreams were? Yeah, so at first, at first the cattle were very, very healthy, eating a lot, and then they became very sick. So that was one dream. 
He had a second dream. What was that dream? That's what it was about. But what was the actual dream? Right. The wheat grows up and then other stalks grew up and ate that. And for each dream, he said it lasted for how many days? Seven. Seven. And what did that represent? Seven years. Exactly. All right. So for us, when we read the word of God, and this might be some prophecy, just ask our father for the interpretation of that. He says he's not going to do anything except he reveals it to his servants who can then speak about those prophecies. So if you want to know something, ask. And God, most likely, since he's our loving father, is going to give us the answer. Maybe not always, because we know Daniel, God gave him some dreams and told him, you are going to die because <laughs> this stuff isn't going to happen until way later. So go your way. But in most cases, our father will reveal to us what's happening because he wants us to know. He says, I no longer call you servants, but friends, because I've made known to you all of the will of my father. So be confident that you will be able to interpret certain things if God answers your prayer and just plead with him to answer your prayer. So it had to do with seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. That's what the two dreams were about. So, and Steve, kudos to you because you got most of the answers correct. Shows he's studying his word and remembering it. So that's wonderful. Now, in 1772, Joseph was 30 when he was released from prison. So that's 13 years after he went into prison. And if you subtract 13 from 1785, you get down to 1772. So we know it was in 1772 when Joseph was 30 when he was released from prison. And these scriptures tell us about that. He also has his two sons at age 35 because the scripture says, that um, or that might be a 30, yeah, 35. It's two years before the time of plenty um, ran out. So it would have been after five years of plenty, and that's when he had his two sons. So, and that two sons, who knows Joseph's two sons? Ephraim, Ephraim and Manasseh, right. So then in 1762, Joseph was 40, that's 10 years later. He was 40 when Jacob enters Egypt. And we know that he was 30 when he was freed from prison. He was 37 after seven years of plenty gathering food. And then he was 39 after two years of the famine had elapsed. And then he was 40 the next year when Jacob enters Egypt. So again, you can keep those dates in mind, that chronology. And this is when he reveals himself to his brethren who had sold him into slavery. So that's how we know um, that first part that we were talking about in 1802, Joseph was born. You just continue to do the calculations and see that he was also 40 when Jacob came to Egypt at age 130. So it takes a lot of studying the scriptures to put it all together, but it's beautiful when it comes together as a full picture. And then in 1692, Joseph was 110 when he dies. And sometime later, a pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph. And I'll read that. So in Exodus chapter one, verses six through eight, this is Exodus chapter one and verses six through eight. It says, Joseph and all his brothers. So the 11 brothers, all of the sons of Jacob, all of them in that generation died. So they were the first generation to go into Egypt, first generation of Israelites. Jacob had 12 sons. They were the first generation to go into Egypt, and that generation died. Then in verse 7, it says, The Israelites multiplied greatly and grew exceedingly mighty, such that the land was filled with them. Now, there arose a new pharaoh over Egypt, which didn't know Joseph. And when it says it did, he didn't know Joseph, he most likely heard about Joseph. It's just saying he wasn't alive when Joseph was alive. So he didn't know him personally. And you can also say 
I don't know you. Like, get out my face. I don't know you. So it's like disrespecting that person also. So Pharaoh rose that disrespected Joseph, gave him no respect for what he had done. But what we're seeing here is that the Israelites entered into Egypt and they were there for quite a long time before they became enslaved, right? They were free people. Does everybody agree with that? They were in Egypt. <laughs> Tim was looking kind of strange. All right, so Joseph is sold into slavery in 1785. He dies, and so he dies at 110. So that's already, what is that? 93 years. So 93 years, they're in Egypt without being enslaved, right? On top of that, there was a time that passed where another pharaoh arose that didn't know Joseph. And we're going to find out something else. Israel's slavery in Egypt began after 1692, because that's when Joseph died. They weren't enslaved at that point. So it had to have, the slavery had to have begun after 1692, when Joseph died. And we know, not that I've proven this yet, but we do know that it ended in 1447 BC. We're going to prove that. And that's when the Exodus occurred. Therefore, Israel was enslaved for no more than 245 years. They couldn't have been enslaved for any more than 245 years. Now, we're going to see why that's important. But notice something else. In 1527, Moses was born. We know this date because Moses was 80 years old when he returned to Egypt to lead the Exodus. What happened when Moses was 40? He killed someone and then he fled. Right. And he was in the wilderness for how many years? So when he came back to Egypt, if you have 40 and 40, how old was he? 80. And the scripture clearly tells us that he was 80. All right. So he was 80 when he returned to lead the Exodus. So if the Exodus was in 1447 BC, and we still haven't proven that yet, but if it was, just count back 80 years, and we know Moses was born in 1527 B.C., all right? And Acts chapter 7, 22 through 30 tells us, and Exodus 7, verses 1 through 7 prove this. So in 1447 was the Exodus. Now, from Abraham's death in 1877 B.C. to the Exodus in 1447 B.C., is 430 years, 430 years. And that's exactly as had been designed by God Almighty. Because when God wants something to happen, he's always on time. He plans things perfectly. It could be a hundred years in advance. It could be a thousand years in advance, but he plans things perfectly and they happen exactly as he intended them to do because he's God Almighty. And we're going to come back to Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 through 41, and Galatians chapter 3, 10 through 18 shortly. But I'm going to explain 430 now. But remember, from Abraham's death in 1887, 1877 BC, if you just subtract 430 years, you'll come to 1447 BC. All right, so let's look at this chart. A lot of columns. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to explain the uh, 430 years. So in 2052, as you can see over to the left, Abram was born. And we can see that from previous uh, messages. Then in 1977, Abram enters Canaan. And we know that from Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4. That's when Abram is 75 years old. And then we know that Isaac was born. And Abram is 100 years old because that happened 25 years later. And then Jacob was born in 1892, which we saw again in previous message. Genesis 25, 26, you can read that. Isaac is 60. So then we come to Abram. Abram dies in 1877. And then that's when the 430-year period of time starts. That's when the 430-year period of time starts, 
And we're going to see when we get to the end that it ended at the Exodus. So if we know when the Exodus was, we just count back 430 years and we'll know when the start was. I'm telling you now, because I've studied it and I've tested it over and over again, make sure my math is cool, that the starting point for the 430 years was in 1877 when Abram dies. Then you can see the next chart over to the right, next column. The 12 sons of Jacob were born between 1822 and 1800. And then Joseph was born. And like I said, he was 40 when Jacob entered into Egypt in 1802. Then Joseph was sold to Egypt and in prison. And he went from 17 years old to 30 years old being in prison. And uh, then in 1762, Jacob and the other Israelites uh, entered into Egypt. And Joseph oversees the seven years of plenty and the two years of famine. And the next year, Jacob is 130 and Joseph is 40 at that time. Then in 1692, Joseph dies. And later, a Pharaoh rules that didn't know Joseph. We just read that. And then in 1527, Moses is born. And we know that when he was 80, he came back. So he came back the year of the Exodus. And the Exodus would have occurred in 1447 BC. And that's when the 430 years ends. All right. So here's something that can be very confusing to people who read the Bible. And because it can be very confusing, people will say the Bible is not accurate. That's why studying something like this is very important. You should always be able to give an answer to a person who says, oh, you can't trust in the word of God because something is wrong with it somewhere, okay? But when you go back to the original Hebrew or Greek, and when you find ancient manuscripts that were written before the King James Version in 1618 or something like that was the King James Version that a Bible written, but you go back to older manuscripts and you compare them, the truth is revealed. So again, the song, let me see you more clearly. Let me see your truth more clearly. So it takes prayer. It takes study, maybe fasting, but ask God to show you things. And he is faithful to do that. So I'm going to blow this up because I can't see it. And I'm sure you can't see it either. <laughs> so when we read Exodus chapter 12, when we read Exodus chapter 12, Verses 40 and 41, it says, the Israelites lived in Egypt 430 years. That is not accurate, but that's the King James Version of the Bible. That's not the original word of God. So when King James, whoever translated into English, Whenever they did, this was mistranslated. In verse 41, this part is true and it's accurate in the King James Version. So at the end of the 430 years, all the armies of Yahweh went out from the land of Egypt. So we know the Exodus is the end point for 430 years. You have to know when the Exodus was to count back 430 years and know when the 430 years started, okay? Now, Dr. Kennecott says that, and this is from Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible. Dr. Kennecott says that the descendants of Israel did not dwell 430 years in Egypt. So it's not just me saying this. There's a whole bunch of people who understand this because they've studied just like I have. So Dr. Kennecott says that the descendants of Israel did not dwell 430 years in Egypt, and it may be easily proved. Go through the chronology that we just went through, and it can be easily proved that it's impossible for them to have lived in Egypt, much less been slaves in Egypt for 430 years. So then what's the explanation for Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 in particular? Well, he gives the explanation. The Samaritan Pentateuch, which was written uh, many, many centuries before the uh, um, King James Version of the Bible. 
So the Samaritan Pentateuch, in all its manuscripts and printed copies, reads the place thus. And this is in Hebrew. I'm not going to try to read the Hebrew. But when you translate that into English, and this is what's in parentheses, it says, now, the first thing, the sojourn, right? What does sojourning mean? Travel. It doesn't mean enslavement, right? Now, it could be that you're enslaved while you're a sojourner traveling through somewhere. You might be restricted as a slave. But sojourning can also be while you're free, just traveling all over the place. So it says, now the sojourning of the children of Israel, and here's the second part, and of their fathers. Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Was Abraham ever enslaved in Egypt? No. Was Isaac ever enslaved in Egypt? No. Was Jacob? ever enslaved in Egypt? No, because he died before the slavery happened. So it is, number one, the sojourning of the children of Israel, so sojourning, walking around, and of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now here's the third part, because it gets very specific. Which sojourned where? In the land of Canaan. Fourth thing, and in the land of Egypt. The fifth thing, that whole period of time was 430 years. That's the explanation of Exodus chapter 12, verse 40. So when somebody says to you, I've seen some kind of program on TV, and this literally happens. <laughs> Here's these supposed expert theologians expert archaeologists, expert historians, and they're going to tell you, and I challenge you to try this, just go and Google in what year was the Exodus. You'll have a whole bunch of people tell you it was in the 1200s BC, not in 1447 BC. Does anybody know why they would put it in the 1200s? Because it was 430. Yeah, because they put the slavery at 430 years. And we know that they were not in slavery for 430 years. There's a second reason why, too. It's because a lot of people believe that the Israelites were alive during, not alive, they were alive, <laughs> but that the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt, they were enslaved in Egypt while Ramses II was the pharaoh. And Ramses II actually ruled over Egypt in the 1200s. So for those two reasons, because Ramses II, which was a great builder of Abu Simbel and Luxor, a couple other places, they say that the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt because he was the pharaoh of the Exodus. We're going to shatter that myth as well. That's also incorrect. But on TV, I mean, people that spend thousands of dollars, probably millions of dollars, researching stuff, doing archaeology, and they get it wrong. We have to be people of the book that know the truth. So study to show yourselves approved. Know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Free from all of these errors, free from confusion, and it will help you to believe that the Bible is the only accurate prophecy and history book. Okay? So let's go over that again. Now, number one, the sojourning, people living, not necessarily enslaved, but the sojourning of the children of Israel, number two, and of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which they sojourned, number three, in the land of Canaan, number four, and in the land of Egypt, and number five, that whole period of time was 430 years. Please keep that in your mind as you're studying the scriptures. So he goes on to say, and a number of other commentaries have this correct. So it may be necessary to observe that the Alexandrian copy of the Septuagint has the same reading as that in the Samaritan. Now, the Alexandrian copy of the Septuagint, if, again, you know your history, the Greeks overtook 
the land of Israel, you know, Alexander the Great, and then the four generals after he died, and then Antiochus Epiphanes. And it was after that time, the Maccabee revolt, it was after that time that Greek had spread throughout the empire. And um, many Jews were learning Greek. They were forced to in order to do their commerce and everything else. And so they said, let us get together. And what we talk about Septuagint means 70. There's actually 72 rabbis that got together and made copies of the Bible. And what he's saying is not only the Samaritan Pentateuch, but also another ancient manuscript that came about 2,000 years before, or 1,800 years before the King James Version of the Bible. This was written. One, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and now the Alexandrian copy of the Septuagint has the same reading as that in the Samaritan. The Samaritan Pentateuch is allowed by many learned men to exhibit the most correct copy of the five books of Moses and the Alexandrian copy of the Septuagint must also be allowed to be one of the most authentic as well as most ancient copies of this version, which we possess. And he's speaking of the King James Version. Now, if we go over, we have a second witness in scripture, the same 430 years spoken of in the Old Testament, which we just read, Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. So the same 430 years spoken of in the Old Testament is the same 430 years spoken of in the New Testament. So let's read that. This is in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verses 15 through 18. This is Galatians chapter 3 and verses 15 through 18. And this is Paul speaking, and he's saying, let me put this in human terms. Even a human covenant, once it is ratified, cannot be canceled or amended. Verse 16. To Abraham and to his seed was the promise spoken. And that's what you were talking about, Marilyn, back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, specifically the latter part of verse 3. That was the first time the gospel was preached to Abraham. So it says to Abraham and to his seed, uppercase, was the promise spoken. It does not say to his seed as of many or as in a plurality of seeds. It says, but to your seed, which is singular, as of one. And this refers to the Christ or the Messiah, the anointed one. And now in verse 17, verse 17, and this I say, the covenant that was ratified by God in Christ, and this covenant that was ratified by God that was in Christ was what he just spoke about, is what he just spoke about. Abraham, I am promising that you're going to have a seed and through that one seed, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah, all nations of the earth will be blessed. It is not through a multitude of seeds. Anybody who thinks that the nation of Israel at any point in their history was a blessing to all other nations is sadly mistaken because they are imperfect people with human nature, just like every other human being who's ever lived. And that means they would bring curses upon people, maybe more curses than blessings. Just like right now, and you got to appreciate them uh, defending themselves against the terrorist organization Hamas. But what they are doing to innocent women and children, that's not a blessing to their nation. What they are doing is murder, murder of tens of thousands of people. So never think that the Israelites at any point as a nation has ever been a blessing to all nations. There's only one Israelite, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah Yeshua, who has been a blessing to all nations. So that's what this is talking about. So that covenant that was ratified by God in Christ, speaking of this covenant that through your seed, Abraham, your seed being Yeshua the Messiah, 
that all nations of the earth would be blessed. That's why it says ratified by God the Father in Jesus the Christ. So this covenant can't be annulled by the law that came into being 430 years after. So when did the old covenant uh, become a covenant? When was it enacted? When was it enacted? It was enacted on Mount Sinai, right? Yeah, that was the date. <laughs> it was 1447, and that was the date. But the old covenant came into being when God Almighty, right, spoke, well, actually, it was the Messiah Yeshua in his pre-incarnate form. So let's just say Yahweh. When Yahweh spoke the Ten Commandments, the only ten words or sentences that he's ever spoken in history to all people, right? When he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, the only word that Yahweh ever wrote with his own finger, that's when the Old Covenant came into effect at Mount Sinai when the Ten Commandments were given. And even the Ten Commandments, as I showed, I think, in the previous program, it's called the Covenant. That's why when the tables of stone were put into the ark, it's called the Ark of the Covenant because the ark holds the covenant. What's the covenant? The Ten Commandments written on two tables of stone. That's the Old Covenant. So what it is saying is this covenant came into existence 430 years after something. So we know, and we're going to prove it one other way, that 1447 was the year of the Exodus. Was the old covenant made in the same year as the Exodus? Was the old covenant made in the same year of the Exodus? What's your answer? Yes. Yeah, because it was only made about 50 days later. So less than two months later, right? Because we know that they came out the day after Passover, the actual night, the first night of the night to be much observed. And then you count 50 days to the Feast of First Fruit, to so the Feast of Weeks, which nowadays is called Pentecost. So it's in the same year, 1447. So the covenant that came 430 years later was that covenant, the old covenant, where the law was given. That was in the same year as the Exodus. So this covenant came 430 years after something. What did it come after? It came after Abraham's death in 1877. So again, you subtract 430 years, you come to 1447. But why is it after Abraham's death? It says it came into being 430 years after so as to abolish the promise. It can't abolish the promise. For if the inheritance, and that's the key, how do you inherit something? You inherit something when someone dies, and then that promise is passed on. So what happened? Abraham died, and that promise was passed on to Isaac and then later to Jacob. Okay? So, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by way of promise. And so if I scroll over a little bit more, you're going to see Yeshua is the promised seed and the mediator of the new covenant. That promise was made 430 years before Moses received the Ten Commandments on two tables of stone, and he became the mediator of the old covenant. So the new covenant actually was promised before the old covenant. So the old covenant, therefore, can't do away with what became known as the new covenant. And that's the whole point. The whole point is you always have to focus on the Messiah Yeshua. Okay? That's really the whole point in this. Okay, so now we got one more way to try to prove this about when the exodus occurred. Okay, so from Abraham's death in 1877 BC to the exodus in 1447 BC is 430 years. And from the exodus 
1447 BC, now we're going to have another marker. So please pay attention to this, another marker. From 1447 BC to the building of Solomon's temple in 967 BC is how long? 480 years, 480 years. Now, both timelines prove that the Exodus occurred in 1447 BC. If 1447 is in the middle, 1877, 430 years later, brings you to 1447 BC. From 1447 BC, going forward 480 years, brings you to the time of the building of Solomon's temple. And we're going to prove when Solomon's temple was built. So both timelines prove that the Exodus occurred in 1447 BC. Now, um, can y'all see what's on this chart here? So when we can't see something, what do we do? Open your eyes. What do we sing today? Show me your ways. I'm seeking your face, right? So guess what? If we pray, God, open my eyes because I'm seeking your face. What is God going to do? Well, guess what? <laughs> God just opened your eyes. <laughs> All right. So if we look over in the bottom right-hand corner, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, I want someone to read that for me. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Hundred and eighty year after people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Lee, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay, isn't God wonderful? Yeah. When you ask Him for something, He gives it to you. Please read that one more time. In the four hundred and eightieth year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of seed, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Okay, thank you. Do we understand what she just read? It is so beautiful, so perfect, because it's like a puzzle, and you start to put all the pieces together, and it's such a beautiful picture. It says in the fourth year of his reign, right, he started to build the temple. So in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, he began to build the temple. And it says 480 years before that was the Exodus. That's what you just read, right? So all we have to do is find out when Solomon started to build this temple, go back 480 years, and that should reach the Exodus. Does it do it? Well, look at this chart. Again, I didn't make this chart up. If I did, I'd have 967 instead of 966, but that's okay. This chart was made by somebody. It says that Solomon's temple began to be built in 966 BC, 480 years after the Exodus. And they show 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So if you want to, you can do it on your calculator. Add 480 years to 966, and where do you come to? You come to 1446. So because we know that Abraham died in 14, I mean, 1877, which 430 years later was um, 1447, we're going to go with 1447. So this chart, this calculation the person made up, we have a discrepancy of one year. But um, 1447 is the time. And they give this chart showing that there was Moses. Again, Moses, if we're looking at the left-hand side, um, Moses was 80 years old when he came to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. I'm saying he was 80 years old in 1527. This person is saying 1526. So again, the one-year difference is going to be there. So he was 80. And I'm going to say 1447. Then they were in the wilderness for 40 years. That would have been 1407. And then you see there was a period of years when Joshua and the judges ruled. And then you had Saul, David, and Solomon. And so in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, which would have been 1960, I mean, 967 BC, you count back 400, 
80 years and it brings you to the Exodus. So you have this red mark and then you have this green triangle. That is the 480 year difference. So whether you start at 1447 at Abraham's death, when the inheritance was passed on, that's the triggering event, and you come 430 years to 1447 BC, or whether you start at 967 BC in the fourth year when Solomon began to build his temple, you count back 480 years, it brings you to 1447 BC. When was the Exodus? 1447 BC. If you see anything else on television, whether it's YouTube or um, what's the fancy thing that the younger people? TikTok. TikTok, yeah. Whether it's TikTok or anything else, Instagram, whatever it is, and it says it's a different date, don't believe them. All right. We've just gone through the chronology. And it's ju it just amazes me, again, that movie makers, documentary makers, um, archaeologists, historians, all of these people can come up with wrong answers where all of the evidence points to the absolute truth that the Exodus was in 1447 BC. Now, again, why am I emphasizing this so much? It's only because God said that that was going to happen. And if he said it was going to happen, it's going to happen. And we need to rely 100% on the word of God. And if there's ever any discrepancy in like the King James Version of the Bible, just look some more and you'll find God will reveal it to you. Pray, open my eyes because I'm seeking your face and then be still. Know that he is God and know that he's going to answer your prayer because he wants us to understand his will. Now, I told you I was going to explode this myth that Ramses II was the Pharaoh during the Exodus. Because Moses II, he reigned from 1479 to 1425 BC. Let me ask you this question. Does 1447 BC fall between 1479 and 1425? Yeah, it falls in between that period of time. So then we know who the Pharaoh was. But do you see what I have highlighted on the screen? I I can't make this stuff up. Do you see what's highlighted on the screen? What's underlined? Moses. Moses. Where do you think Moses got his name from? Because Tut Moses was the pharaoh at the time when Moses was born. So he was named Moses. Now, let's see in here. Um, Silas, are you a junior or a second? You're a junior? So that means your dad was Silas. Does it make sense? Tut Moses names his son Moses because wasn't Moses raised as Pharaoh's son? It makes sense. I can't make this up. It can't be any more perfect. So if you do your study, the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Tut Moses the third. So obviously there was a Tut Moses the first then a second, then a third, then you have Moses. I don't know what Tut mean. I should have figured that out because maybe Moses would have been Tut Moses the fourth if he wouldn't have killed the Egyptian and then had to flee when he was 40 years old. So under Tut Moses the third, the Rechmir, and that's like a governor, occupied the visorship. So he was ruling over lots of Egypt at the time. And Rechmir's tomb, Brother Tim had a chance to see this. Um, Barbara, I don't think you went to the tomb on that day. Yeah, Sister Christian had a chance to see it. Brother Sunday did. Who? Sure. Me yeah. Yeah, you and Barbara didn't go. Right. So, what I'm about to show you is not again something I made up. We also with our own eyes, right? So we go into Rechmir's tomb. This is in the Valley of the Kings and Queens. And then there's a different section that's a little bit off that also contains like governors and mayors, well, their equivalent people. So this is where Rechmir's tomb was, right in the Valley of the 
kings and queens. And in there is carved at the base of the hill of Sheikh Abba blah, 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 in Thebes. And is this, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so it is exceptional and historically important for its pictorial quality, especially in the text it contains, which explains his various duties. Now, um, I think I have a note here. It says, oh yeah, so see YouTube video that I did about, and it's titled Israel in Prophecy, 1450 BC to 750 BC. If you go back and look on our YouTube channel, Christian Ambassador's YouTube channel, and you look for that particular video, it's going to give you a lot more explanation of things, but I'm not going to go as much detail into that today. And then the second note. So next we're going to see my video taken inside this tomb, and I'm narrating this. Okay, and this is when we went to Egypt for the Feast of Tabernacles in 2021. So let's go and just, and this is not the video, this is a picture. So I want to tell you about this real quickly. If you look at the Egyptians, these are the guys with the longer white skirts on, okay? And they have the, the darker hair, the ones at the top, than the ones right below where it says Israelites in Egypt. They have the lighter hair, but they all have the longer loin cloth. If you look in the middle, this is a pond where you see this is a pond here and you have two Israelites in here or let's say two people first. Two people in here and they're in the pond. What do you think they're doing in this pond? What do you think they're doing in this pond? They're getting water to make mud bricks. That's what this picture is telling us. So they're in this blue pot, blue part, that's a pond. They're mixing up the water. Then they bring it over and notice these guys, as you're looking at it to the right, notice that they have on shorter loin cloths, almost it more looks like a diaper than a skirt. These are the Israelites. And they are pictured here making bricks. And whose tomb is this in? It's in Rechmir's tomb. Who was Rechmir? He was the one overseeing. He's like a slave master. He was the one overseeing the Israelites as they were making bricks out of mud without straw. Remember? Pharaoh got really mad and said, you got to do it without straw. This is mind-boggling that this history is here. And let me tell you something. Most people, when they go to the Valley of the Kings and the Queens, they never go here. Never go here. You know why? Because all they want to see is where King Tut was. That's it. <laughs> I'm going to Egypt. I'm going to see the pyramids, which are in the north and the Sphinx. I'm going to come down to the Valley of the Kings and the Queens and see Luxor and Karnak Temple. And then I'm going to... Uh, go to see King Tut, where King Tut was discovered. That's it. This is like a hidden treasure. Almost no one goes into Rechmir's tomb. And yet, Rechmir was the slave master under Pharaoh Tut Moses during the time of the Exodus. And here you have a history book written about Israelites making bricks in Egypt. All right, so I'm going to play this only like 40 seconds. This is a scene of the Israelites taking water out of the lake. That's that green kind of bluish thing. And then over to the right, you see some Asians and Africans who are building with bricks. And this fits exactly during the time of near the Exodus where the Israelites were told to make houses out of bricks because this is Rechmir, who was the freezer of Thutmoses III, and Thutmoses III ruled during the time of the Exodus. So okay, and you heard some noise in the background. That person was very rude. 
that was the tour guide giving a tour, and he wouldn't shut up when I was talking. I thought that was so rude. <laughs> no, so I tried to whisper so that I respected the tour guide, but um, I had to get that in. I had to capture that. And actually, that was my main focus for going to Egypt. Or I shouldn't say my main focus it was Feast of Tabernacles, but that was the main thing I wanted to see. Because the first two times we went in 1998 and 2000, I didn't know about this. But when I found out about this, I said, I got to go to this tomb and see this for myself. History right before our eyes of the Israelites being in Egypt. So Moses leads the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years, right? So if the Exodus was in 1447 BC, 40 years later would be 1407 BC. So Moses leads the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years and leads them back to the land of Canaan in the fourth generation. Again, just so mind boggling because our God is so perfect in his timing. All right, so let's read this. This is in Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 16. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 16. It says, Yahweh's word came to Abram in a vision, saying, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Abram said, Adonai Yahweh, what will you give me since I go childless? And he who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. So Abram is looking back at the promise through your seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed and that he would also have a multitude of seed. And he's saying, but I don't have any seed yet. So how are you going to answer your promise? How are you going to fulfill it? And uh, he goes on to say, you've given no children to me and one born in my house is my heir. Verse four, Yahweh responded, this man will not be your heir, but he who will come out of your own body will be your heir, referring to Isaac. Verse five, Yahweh brought him outside and said, look now toward the sky and count the stars, the stars, if you're able to count them. So will your offspring be. Now, this does refer to the physical nation of Israel, a multitude of people. And Abram believed Yahweh and Yahweh credited Abraham's or Abram's faith to him for righteousness. And then Yahweh said, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. Abraham, why are you questioning me? I brought you out of the land and told you you were going to inherit it. I'm God. Why are you questioning me? But you know what? Abraham was a pretty bad dude. <laughs> Not only did he question him here, when else did he question Yahweh? Yeah, when the Sodomites, when, the, when Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he pleaded saying, God, you're merciful, you're righteous. Don't wipe out all these people. And I think he got down to 10. If we just find 10 righteous, and of course, unfortunately, they didn't. But anyway, so Abraham, he's a pretty, pretty bad dude. And the point is, we can go boldly before the throne of grace too and ask God, our father, questions. Charlene, I will always remember in one of her prayers, which she tells us about, God, if you were my father, you would show up and give me such and such. And then a neighbor came and gave you food, like within, okay. within a couple of minutes. That's how you put God to the test, right? Okay, so, and then Abram asked, Adonai Yahweh, how will I know that I, I will inherit it? I hear what you're saying, but you gotta show me a little bit more proof. All right, so Yahweh is very patient. And in verse 9, Yahweh responded, okay, you want a sign, then bring me a heifer three years old, and a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And then Abram brought Yahweh all these and divided them in the middle, meaning he cut the birds in part, and he also laid each half opposite the other, so he created like an aisle, one half of the animals on this side, one half of the animals, but not the birds. Yeah, just the animals, not the birds. Because it says, but he didn't divide the birds. So in verse 11, the birds of prey, different birds, came down on the carcasses and Abram drove them away. So what is this sign that God is giving to Abram? 
What does this sign mean? Cut the pieces in half, lay them opposite each other, which he did. And then some birds of prey came down to eat like they would, like vultures eat. But Abram drove them away. So what is this saying? Mm. Mm. You know, Brother Tim. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> and may he become like those two pieces that they have slaughtered if you don't keep his promise. Exactly. So I cut these down the middle. I'm putting them on the side. And it doesn't specifically say here, but I think in Leviticus it talks about where you walk between the pieces. It's like Yahweh saying, Abram, you can cut me in half if I don't fulfill my promise. I'm walking down here and I'm saying, just like these animals were cut in pieces, you can cut me to pieces if I don't fulfill my word. Now, something that's kind of similar, you know, the First Nation people here in America, what did they do in order to cut a covenant? What was their tradition? Right. They would cut their wrists. One person would cut their wrists, the other one cut their wrists, and they joined the blood together, saying that we are entering into a covenant. So covenants always have to do with blood. In this case, they cut the animals in part. Of course, there was blood. You walk between them saying, you can cut me like this. Divide me from you. Stop believing in me if I don't fulfill my word. So what about the last part, the birds of prey? came down in the carcasses and Abram drove them away. What's this meaning? Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So Sister Charlene got it exactly right. God is saying to Abram, your enemies are going to try to attack your descendants. But I'm telling you that I'm going to drive them away because I'm going to fulfill my promise. So I'm going to drive them away. That's exactly right. And we know that because we'll go on and prove that. All right. So in verse 12, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and then terror and great darkness fell on him because in this dream, he saw his descendants catching hell, as they say, going through slavery eventually in Egypt. And then in verse 13, he said to Abram, know for sure. Now, doesn't that... That should be so comforting and empowering. Know for sure. Know that you know that you know. Never let any doubt come into your mind. Know for sure that your offspring will live as foreigners in lands that are not theirs and will become servants. So they're going to live in foreigner, as foreigners in lands that are not theirs. That's in Canaan. They sojourn in Canaan, plus they sojourn in Egypt. And then they're going to become servants in a land that's not theirs. They're also going to be afflicted. This series of events will last for 400 years. I will also judge that nation whom they serve. Did God judge Egypt? How did he judge them? I'm sorry. At Passover, with the 10 plagues leading up to Passover, that's how he judged the nation. He struck them down with 10 plagues. And on top of that, it says, afterward, they will come out with great wealth. Did they come out with great wealth? Yeah. They went to the Egyptians and said, give it up. <laughs> give me your jewelry. Give me your cows. Give me everything. And what the Egyptians do? Hey, take it. Get out of here. Just please leave. We don't want any more destruction. We know now that your God is the one true God and all our gods are false gods because every God of Egypt, well, I won't say every God of Egypt, but at least 10 gods of Egypt were represented in the 10 plagues and Yahweh, the one true God, destroyed, figuratively speaking, all 10 of Egypt's false gods. But he tells them, but you will go to your fathers in peace. So you're not going to see the period of time when the Israelites are enslaved. Did Abraham die before that time? Yes, he did. Okay. And then it says, 
in the fourth generation, they will come here again. So he's speaking to Abram when he's in the land of Canaan. And he says, in the fourth generation, they will come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So what does this fourth generation mean? Okay, what did we read earlier? Joseph and all of his brothers, that generation died, right? That generation was the first generation. All of the 12 sons of Israel, that was the first generation. So we're going to look to prove God's word again. So we see the genealogy of Moses, of course, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then we're looking at Judah and Levi and the 10 other patriarchs. Now, we know that Yeshua eventually came through Judah, but who did Moses come through? He came through Levi. Was Levi one of the 12 sons who entered into Egypt? So Levi would have been the first generation, right? Okay, Levi has Koath as his son. Koath is the second generation. Koath has Amram, that's the third generation. Amram marries Jochebed. And Amram and Jochebed give birth to Moses. Four generations. And who led them back to the land of Canaan? Moses. So when the scripture says in the fourth generation, they will come here again, Again, God's prophecy is simply history in advance. It's going to happen. And not only is it going to happen, it's going to happen exactly the way and in exactly the time as he says. So whenever you're studying prophecy, pray, God, I'm seeking your face. Show me your ways. Open my eyes that I may see. And then stand still, be still, and know that he is God. Know that he's your father know that he will reveal to you all things necessary for us to know, necessary for us to be strong and necessary for us, as Paul said, to be all things to all people, always ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us.